So welcome to 3GE session, Persistent Identifiers Using Archival Resource Keys to keep it all together at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Ming Yu Chen. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the head of metadata services at the University of Texas at Dallas a member of the TCDL planning committee. I'm pleased to be your session moderator today. Texas Digital Library and uh, the TCDL planning committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everybody that is uh, free from all forms of uh, harassment and inclusive of all people. TCDL wants to take care of everybody, especially today, if you feel so heavy and want to take a moment of rest, so we totally understand. We ask that everybody here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action. Attempt a collaboration before conflict. Refrain from the demeanor discriminatory or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. You can also view of a code of conduct on TDL org. I will post it in the chat later. The session will run until approximately 3.50 p.m. Please feel free to take a break as you need it. I invite you to, to say hello in chat. Let us know where you are uh, drawing from and uh, share resources. Take uh, uh, comments throughout today's session. You are also encouraged to post your questions in the uh, chat. Yeah, I will be watching your uh, questions share them with your uh, speakers during the uh, QA session at the end. Now I'm pleased to introduce our uh, speakers, Destiny Scott, Mark Phillips, Dora Wall, Sean Watkins. I will hand things over to you now to get started. Let's welcome them. Okay, thank you so much. It's good to be here. I'll um, start sharing my screen. I can see this. So thank you all for coming. We're talking today about persistent identifiers. And um, kind of, uh, I'm going to give just the basics on what PIDs are, why we kind of care in general, and then some of the considerations to kick us off. Um, well, PIDs, as many of you know, they're mostly a long-lasting reference to uh, an object. It can be people, such as ORCID, that's just one example, or places, like their organizations, or things. Um, and it can be a document, file, web page, or other entity. Um, but the whole purpose is that these identities are uniquely identified and connected to create reliable links between them. So the idea of persistent identifiers is just a new name for a concept that's been around for a long time. Um, publishers used to use things like I ISBNs and ISSNs, and still do, for serials and text objects. But with more emerging, growing digital resources, there became a need for more machine-readable PIDs for foreign digital resources and starting to expand that into other identities. So the basic tenets of any PID system are to make these entities discoverable, ac accessible, usable, intelligible, interoperable, and accessible. So an interconnected network to specifically identify these entities. 
so why we care about PIDs at all and why are they important? Um, mostly because reliable URLs are lacking. And if you're lucky, you'll find a fun 404 page not found that has a picture or a video or something. But um, the reality is you're still not getting to the information. And they call these kind of uh, web page tombstones type of thing. So here, um, when I was preparing this, I there's a lot to the history of PIDs, and that could actually be a, probably a whole half day of TCDO, but and just kind of a brief overview of some of the history here. Um, as soon as the internet was launched, um, basically URLs began breaking, and it introduced this idea for URL forwarding. Um, and that seemed like an easy fix. Uh, basically with you can point an old url to a new url and it still resolves or points back to the old url um, this fostered kind of a system of indirect indirection and created what later became kind of known as the internet indirection infrastructure where things are getting redirected so much it tends to get hard to keep up and registration services like pearls emerged as a way to store these um, redirects. Handles were also introduced in the mix um, as kind of a vendor for registering and storing URLs and redirection. Um, DOIs became very popular as a fee-based registrar, especially among publishers who were kind of looking at ways to organize and monopolize. monopolize. Um, so there's a lot of history here and um, I would encourage if anyone's interested, there's also a link later, but this uh, or the art origin story is really interesting. So, um, but some examples of, you know, arcs, DOIs, handles, URNs are kind of for the very popular PIDs or persistent identifiers. All of these have been around for more than 20 years. They all have a similar goal of addressing that internet indirection infrastructure by creating permanent links. Um, they all start with a string to identify the name of the assigning authority, and they all require active updating of those URL redirects or links. Um, so the biggest thing um, I want to also mention is that PIDs, as vital as they are for so many of, of us, they are also only as persistent as the organizations that provide and support them. So it's not something easy that you can just implement and then let it, let it run and forget about it and don't look at it again for 10 years. You kind of need a plan. Um, Definitely PIDs are important also as um, institutions where we have archives and digital resources that we make available. It's important to demonstrate our commitment to stewardship. And when we do that, we can start planning how we want to implement PIDs and keep up with them. So it really relies on that institutional commitment and hope. So, um, do PIDs solve this issue of broken links? Um, no, <laughs> they don't do that necessarily, but there, there is no really across the board solution yet, but PIDs are making a lot of broad steps forward and they're a really important um, area in the right direction. Oh, oh, my apologies. This was the slide, you all didn't see that. Um, anyway, PIDs are only as persistent. And um, do PIDs solve broken links? Uh, no, okay, my apologies. So these are kind of the, the major causes of broken links when we're talking about why PIDs don't solve the entire issue of broken links. Um, but also this chart kind of helps demonstrate some of those differences in you know, handles, DOIs, ARCs. There's a lot of different considerations to think about when you start planning and uh, defining how you want to move forward if you want to start using ARCs. 
So kind of some broad considerations, just um, what units are we trying to identify? So as some of our speakers talk about today, when we look at preservation and archival work and really, you know, what it is, people, places, things, that. And also, when do you need to assign or mint a PID? Um, I mean, would it be for everything? I know with Dataverse, so data is a big area where we talk about, do you mint a, a DOI for every version of the data set or just the final data set? And also, if PIDs are minted before or after ingest, that's a big consideration. And then just the technical implementation system and strategies. But um, to me, as I kind of learn more about PIDs also, it feels like a cost versus loss, where it's, it's really important to set up a structure to look into ways of doing this so that we don't lose access and show our commitment to um, our stewardship. And um, more information on the slides and also uh, PID Palooza for any fellow PID enthusiasts. Um, there's not one this year for 2022, but maybe next year and can follow up. And thank you all. I'll stop sharing. All right, can you all see my slides? Awesome. So <clears throat> this is the, so I'll be actually talking twice today. This is with my hat on as um, the, the ARC Alliance. And so um, this is going to carry on from the introduction that, that Laura just gave. Um, it's got a little bit of duplication as, as will happen, but um, this, this side of the presentation will talk a little bit more about the ARC identifiers as, as, a, as a specific implementation of persistent identifiers, and then give you some information about the ARC Alliance, which is the group that's been formed to provide stewardship and sustainability to the ARC specification and some of the tooling that's behind the, um, the ARC standard itself. So as Laura mentioned, um, the if we're going to preserve content in, in, in the digital realm, we have to be able to provide access to it. And in with that, it's the long-term protection of these digital resources. Um, the, the goals are to make them available for a wide variety of, of uses and also to be able to weather many, many different kinds of um, challenges that will come up um, against digital resources, whether they be human error, natural, natural disaster, legal challenge, and or deliberate attacks, social upheaval, bankruptcy. Um, a lot of these are things that no technology can really <laughs> solve um, or mitigate 100%. Um, but I think the most um, important component that we can actually do, especially in our, in our roles as uh, managers of repositories and managers of digital content, is look at long-term access to these resources and to make sure that when we publish resources, um, either digitized or born digital and make them available, that those are done in a way that um, has a, a, the concept of persistence associated with it. So within this space, we're defining persistent identifiers as a, a persistent way of, of um, uh, accessing content. And then um, in the greater web sphere, these are also referred to as permalinks, you'll, you'll see, but um, within the kind of the, the libraries, archives, uh, museums, and gallery space, we've, we've settled on the persistent identifiers as our terminology. So why do persist, why, why persistent identifiers? Um, the, the biggest cause um, that we were really focused on at the very beginning of this process back 20 years ago was looking at the, the proliferation of link rot. Um, the fact that, you know, content would go online and then things would move. Um, <clears throat> and it's sometimes in moving in very subtle ways where, you know, you put a, you put a URL out there and say, this is, you know, our digital library is called dspace.library.something.something. And then 10 years later, you say, well, actually we no longer use dspace. So we're gonna use a different system 
but now all those links are broken. And why this becomes a problem is in the scholarly record, you have links into those systems. That's the whole point of us making these, con these resources available is so they get used. And when they get used and cited and referenced, you want people to come back to them. Um, there's the uh, uh, often touted, like the URL has a lifespan of about 100 days. So um, there, many of these are not, many URLs in the world are just not long lived. I think that's different than the kinds of things that we generally deal with in, in libraries because we think about them and we're thinking about what we're minting and how we're putting this content online. As with any technical problem, there's many different technical solutions that could be applied. And one um, question is, you know, why even worry about this? Why not just use URLs and rely on search engines to index content? You can always find it later. Well, the, the main reason, I mean, as all of us have done research for a presentation or article, you spend, you know, hours trying to find that one thing and you want to cite it and you want to be able to go back to it and reference it and build work on it and once it's gone you may not be able to find that thing we've all we've all forgotten a url and tried to find a thing but we're never able and whether it's a, a research article or even just a website or a reference to a, a a recipe that we wanted and it's kind of just disappeared from our grasp and so to be able to keep that from happening and as laura mentioned there are many different approaches to this this space, pearls, handles, URNs, DOIs, and what we're talking about primarily here is the ARC identifiers. So what is an ARC? An ARC? First of all, it stands for Archival Resource Key, um, and it's a labeled URL, which is globally unique identification within it. So this in front of you is a uh, an ARC URL. And so you can identify that it's an ARC by this ARK colon. And that is kind of a, 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 a trigger in your mind. This is this should be a, an ARC identifier. Um, this is the thing that makes it unique within the, the world. And we'll talk about the structure in a second. But this gives you unique identification. Um, this part um, is responsible for um, making this identifier actionable on the web. It's called a resolver. And then this the piece from the arc to the end is actually where the, the global unique identifier piece is um, put into place. And there's some important characteristics of that that allow for it to be unique without um, the concept of any sort of web or host name involved. So looking at the anatomy of an arc, um, the if you start from the left side of the screen, you you run into the the first component is the the piece of the URL that often makes the arc actionable, and so that's called a name mapping authority. Um, that's followed then by that arc label ARK colon, and then the next piece is the name assigning authority number or NAN which is the unique number that identifies an institution who has signed up and registered to mint identifiers under that namespace. So for example, in, in my next uh, talk at the end of this, UNT is 65731. That is our NAN number. Um, and that's what we assign our unique identifiers under. The next piece is an assigned name, or that's actually, and generally that's the, component that gets um, generated when you are assigning name or assigning identity to something. This is the this is the string that your institution is creating and maintaining as the unique components. Um, the ARC specification has the ability to also include concepts of subparts and variants, um, which get used in a in different ways at different institutions. Some institutions don't use them at all. Some institutions use them very heavily. So it that starts to get into the, the very edges of the specification and gets used in different ways by different groups. This is a repeated slide from what Laura showed, but I think the important things, she highlighted the top three. Um, the, the, the biggest thing on all of this is no technology solves all the problems. Um, and I think it's really what, what technology kind of moves you closer to solving problems. And for us um, that use ARCs, 
at least from my interpretation of talking with a lot of people, it gives you a, a set of guidelines and set of practices that allow you and require you to really think about what you're doing. Um, there's, it, it makes you purposeful in the activities you do. You think about how you're generating identifiers. You're not just making them sporadic decisions. You're really putting some thought and effort into it so that in the long run, um, the hope is that things are more persistent. And there are definitely are some technological components that are built into this, the ARC space that do help with that. But nothing, if, if you mint identifiers and constantly move your stuff and don't update your links, stuff's still going to break. So you have to be purposeful in this space. So who is using ARCs? It's, it's a very wide range of, of users from libraries, data centers, archives, museums, publishers, um, some of them national libraries. Um, there's a huge uh, number of um, implementers in um, France uh, because this is being pushed very strongly by the National Library of France. Um, the Internet Archive mints identifiers for almost all of the content that they create. Um, and Family Search actually is one of the largest mentors of identifiers um, where they're minting of ARC identifiers because they're minting those for all of the resources that they're creating. And like I said, these are used in a wide variety of things from genealogical records to published content at Portico. Um, you have scanned books at the Internet Archive. Um, the BNF, the, the National Library of France, actually uses them as the identifiers within their bibliographic catalog, which I think is really cool. Um, the Smithsonian uses them for museum specimens, um, and those that are on this call or on this chat use them for a variety of other, other things as well. So a little bit about the ARC Alliance. This is an initiative that started uh, three or four years ago to try to um, provide some long-term sustainability and um, a home for not only the ARC specification, which is a technical document that's maintained by this group, um, but also some of the components that have been created, such as the NAN registry um, and the different um, uh, resolver code and the actual functioning resolver, the N to T service. So um, the ARC Alliance um, is responsible for registering those name authority names. Um, and so far, we've registered over 950 institutions in the past 21 years, and we've minted over 8.2 billion ARC identifiers, um, or those members, institutions have, have um, minted those identifiers. The ARC Alliance, um, we are uh, a fairly small group. Um, there's uh, information about that on the arcs.org website. There's um, a, a set of uh, Google groups that you can join into to learn more about the ARC specification. If you're really interested in the ARC specification or the tooling around that, um, there actually are some opportunities within the ARC Alliance for those. We have a working group around um, outreach and publicity and training around ARC identifiers. We have a group that's responsible for managing the NAN requests. There's a technical working group which talks about and, and deals with the specification itself. And then there's an advisory group that's responsible for like overall um, uh, activities of the group. So. Um, if you're interested, you can you can uh, follow arcs.org arcs .org on Twitter. You can sign up for a mailing list. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of work in France, so there's actually a French uh, mailing list if that's what you would prefer. Um, and if your institution's interested in actually minting identifiers through ARCs, you can sign up for um, a name authority name at, a, at this NAN request URL. But um, the ARC Alliance is, is always looking for others who are interested in the space, specifically ARC identifiers, and how we can continue to have it as an option for um, long-term persistence to our digital resources that we're creating. And with that, I'll turn it to my colleagues over at the University of Houston. All right. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. And let's see. Oops. I hope you can all see it. 
Um, so Bethany and I are going to take a, a few moments to kind of talk about uh, how arcs are used at UH, um, really covering four big questions, kind of the uh, what are we actually using arcs on, um, when um, we actually do mint our arcs, kind of the how we do it. Uh, and lastly, oftentimes the biggest question is like, why are we doing this? Or how do we get to kind of this uh, decision and using ARCs um, for all of this? Uh, I should note that our NAN is uh, 84475. So uh, that is what we use. Uh, and so first, I think I'll give it off to Bethany to start talking about kind of the what uh, we actually meant. Yes, thank you, Sean. So um, to answer the question of what are we identifying, there's kind of three major categories or types of items that we assign an ARC to. Um, the first one is our digital objects. Uh, so this includes all of the objects within our digital collections repository and our AV repository. Um, they all get an ARC for access. Um, and these access ARCs basically allow us to have that persistent URL for each object, um, ensuring that there's long-term access uh, like Laura and Mark were talking about. Um, and we also use the access arc identifier in the file names for all the files that are associated with that object. Um, and that's basically to make sure that the file names are unique and that they match across the system. So like both in preservation and access. And then uh, secondly, we assign an arc for all of our preservation SIPs. Uh, there's a preservation arc for each package that is stored in Archivematica. And um, that preservation identifier is recorded in the descriptive metadata in the access system so that we can retrieve the preservation files uh, for that object if we ever need to go back to it later. Um, and we also record the preservation arc URL um, in archive space uh, so that it'll be available in the finding aid as well. And then finally, we assign an arc for each controlled vocabulary term in our uh, vocab manager. Um, so this includes all of our subject headings, uh, collection titles, um, agent names. Um, those will all have an arc ID as well. Um, we are kind of anticipating some future linked data applications um, for all of those vocabulary arcs, but uh, we haven't implemented anything quite yet. So next slide. Yes. Okay. Uh, so as far as when the identifiers are assigned, they um, get minted before ingest and actually even before a project is exported from our uh, file management and metadata tool, all of the arcs are minted uh, for the objects in the project. Um, we actually mint the digital object arcs first uh, because those are going to be added to the file names and metadata when we export the project. Um, and then we mint the preservation arcs, uh, we export the preservation SIPs, and we export the access package to be ingested into the repository. And then finally, the arcs are updated when the items are published. Uh, so when each digital object is successfully created, the ERC where URL is updated so that that persistent URL will resolve to its final location in the repository. Um, and then the same process happens with the preservation arcs when uh, the preservation packages are transferred and ingested into Archivematica storage. So with that, I'll hand it back to Sean. Um, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the how we're assigning those identifiers. And we have a lot of systems in place. Um, over the years, we've kind of built out our processes and fine-tuned them. Uh, as Mark was mentioning in his last slides, uh, you do have to have a resolver um, for these ARCs. Uh, and for UH's needs, um, we actually developed our own uh, ARC resolver, uh, which also mints and maintains uh, all of our ARCs. Um, and that is actually through a system that is in-house built uh, that we dub as greens. Um, 
So greens is right now just simply a resolver. So when you uh, put in our arc URL, uh, it will then of course resolve to wherever that needs to be. Um, and it does that through also generating what are called noids. Um, so it's not avoid the noid. Uh, it is nice opaque identifier. Uh, so that is kind of the mechanism that we do at that last kind of part to identify uh, this is the actual string that identifies the object itself. Um, but greens isn't the only resolver or I should say it is our only resolver, but it's not the only tool in our toolbox that we've kind of built out in order uh, to make all of these things work. Um, lastly, as Bethany had just mentioned, um, whenever we actually need to create arcs, we actually do that prior to ingest. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is through our digital object, uh, is, is through our digital project application that we built in-house called Mason. Uh, so what Mason is, is it's simply a, a tool that, that brings up uh, and allows us to manage and maintain all of our digital objects um, for access and for preservations. Um, and it allows uh, it to also talk with our uh, ARC uh, minting system uh, through API calls and such through the back end to actually mint those identifiers, attach them to the digital object itself, and of course uh, provide those identifiers in all of the uh, export packages uh, that we have to both our digital collections repository, our AV repository, uh, and of course our preservation of Archivematica, uh, and uh, that's about it. Uh, for uh, a lot of the minting and processes. So it's not just one thing, it is something that uh, we have different tools to, to be very specific and uh, what we need to happen. Um, so lastly uh, is kind of the why, or kind of how did we get to where we are um, with using ARCs um, and uh, the decisions that we've kind of made with those ARCs. Uh, this all actually all started in 2016, uh, where University of Houston Libraries was kind of going through uh, a process of migrating off of uh, our previous digital repository and onto and developing a new system. Uh, and for those of you that have gone through a big migration plan, uh, you know that can be very painful. Uh, there's a lot of questions involved. Uh, a lot of issues that kind of quickly come up uh, during that migration process. And the big one for us was, well, we're moving from one system to a completely new system that we aren't aware of. And so uh, at that time, we felt like we did need some kind of persistent identifier or some kind of system in place so that it doesn't necessarily fix our problem now, but will fix our problems in the future. Uh, and so ARCs were kind of a way to really combat that problem of like future migrations when it goes from when objects get moved around uh, or new systems get implemented, we have a good way of still uh, resolving those objects to wherever their home may wind up being. Uh, the other uh, addition to ARCs um, that we actually liked is, in addition to being a resolver as well, uh, the ARC also contains uh, what's called an ERC, or an Electronic Resource Citation, which is minimum metadata uh, that is associated with that object. So often we have a, a what, uh, a when, and a where. Uh, the what is often just the title of the object, uh, at least that's what we've chosen for ours. The when is a date of when that item was created or published or uh, maybe even uh, published into a different system. In the where, uh, of course, can be a URL. Um, in our instance, if it is a URL, that's when we resolve it to wherever it's actual online entity exists, uh, but it looks, it's a plain string. It could actually be a physical location as well. So it kind of gave us a little bit of flexibility, of flexibility for when 
if online objects were ever taken down, but we still had a physical copy of that object, we didn't want the ARC to go away. It could still have some use for it. Um, Bethany mentioned this a little bit uh, previously about kind of uh, what we use some of our ARCs for. Um, one of them is, of course, for file naming. So things like our digital objects uh, that we meant, uh, the actual ARC itself is stored within file names. Um, both for our uh, access copies and for presentation or preservation. Um, a lot of them are also uh, embedded within the metadata files um, that we have across our systems. So ARCs, both for the digital object and preservation, uh, are stored and kind of kept together. And as mentioned before, too, uh, we do post both of these up into other system like archive space. Uh, for our finding aids. So we have many different ways to determine where things are and, and keep track of, of all of these systems. So another question is kind of like the why do we actually have two different arcs? If you've kind of been listening in, you'll notice I said, oh, we have a digital object arc and we have a preservation arc. Really, an ARC is an ARC, uh, but within our actual identifier code, uh, we keep track of which ones actually are minted specifically for a digital object and which one is minted specifically for preservation. Um, and that's often because, you know, having one single ARC to keep track of both access and preservation isn't always a one-to-one -one match. Uh, sometimes we have things that are in preservation only and vice versa. There may be instances where we have a single object that's in access that doesn't have one single package for preservation. It may be a collection or a mix. So having um, the ability to identify uh, these different you know, digital object and preservation arcs uh, allows us to be a little bit more flexi uh, flexible and what we ingest throughout our entire ecosystem. So how did we come about all of these kind of uh, decisions? Uh, a lot of it came to a lot of conversations. Um, we have um, a really great team of people behind all of this work. Uh, we talk to our stakeholders. Uh, we have kind of large discussions uh, about uh, what we need to do, how we need to go about doing it. And we, and that allows us to have a deep understanding of all of the workflows from beginning to end. Um, it's really difficult to introduce new ideas or something new if we don't have a complete understanding of how these materials kind of start uh, and where they wind up being. Uh, and lastly, uh, a lot of it was just trial and error. Um, we, we start off thinking that we know what we're doing until we wind up not knowing what we're doing. Uh, and that kind of failure is actually really good because pretty soon we know a lot more at the point of failure than we did when we started. So, um, we really try to embrace that concept of like, you know, we can't get everything right the first time. It's okay to have an idea, to test that idea, uh, and to see how it turns out. And also acknowledge the fact that it is something that we can constantly change and update. Um, and that kind of also leads us back to why we chose ARCs, because mistakes do happen. Um, and ARCs, although not perfect in the fact that, you know, nothing will ever fail, nothing breaks. Um, it does allow us to kind of uh, better keep track uh, of our things. Uh, and if mistakes are made, we can quickly resolve them uh, without having to kind of break everything down and start it back up from the beginning. So that's kind of a, a brief overview of kind of how we do things at UH. This is just how we've decided to do it. There's many different ways of uh, persistent identifiers, uh, many different decisions that have to be made at each institution. Um, and so it, what we do it may or may not work for you or your institution, uh, but certainly um, it's something to try and start out with and see how it goes. With that said, 
I think I'll pass it back to Mark to talk about his uses at UNT. All right, can we see slides again? Okay, perfect. So um, this is my this is my second um, piece with my hat on from UNT, not the ARC Alliance. Um, and so the ARC identifiers at UNT, um, so we mint ARC identifiers for all of the digital objects that we add to our UNT libraries digital collections. And so for us, that could be um, anything from uh, a report, an issue of a newspaper, it could be um, uh, a photograph, an entire book, a data set, uh, an electronic pieces or dissertation at the whatever the kind of item digital object unit might be. Um, we haven't uh, ventured into assigning identifiers for um, other kinds of vocabularies or other um, uh, concepts like names or places. Um, we have different uh, different and uninteresting ways of uh, doing unique identification for those. But really, the place that we focused on the ARC identifiers are within our digital repositories. Um, we assign external facing identifiers for all of our items. Um, and those are the things that you see in the UNT Libraries Digital Collections, like the Portal of Texas History or the UNT Digital Library. Um, all of the identifier resolution is actually just built into our web applications instead of using a centralized resolver. Um, and it, this is uh, both good and bad, um, but uh, it's just a, a little bit different implementation than others. Um, and, and there's some reasons for that that, that we'll get into. Um, in addition to those external facing identifiers that you see, we um, will also, as we, and those are the access identifiers, as we add things to our digital repository, we assign additional internal facing identifiers to all of the items that go into that preservation repository so that we can ensure uniqueness within that system. And then during that process, we also maintain the original external facing identifiers. And I'll give you an example because that gets confusing um, in a second. Ah. And so, like I said, digital objects in our digital collections, um, we have always um, tried to have our digital objects, what we refer to as wearing their identifiers. And so when you have a an ARC identifier like this, the meta DTC DC12345, um, when you look at the URL for that, um, when you click on this and it actually loads the page on the right, if you look in your URL bar, it'll always look like that. Um, and so this kind of fixes that bookmarking problem that exists where, you know, you go to a place and you want to hit bookmark, but if you look on their page, they're like, no, 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 use this other URL, which is different to bookmark this. Um, it's it's to, you see that a lot with handle based systems where there's a, a redirect and a resolution, but but the arc identifier or the handle is no longer the URL that's in your um, browser's uh, bar. And the reason that this is important is that's just how the internet works and that's how the users work. So even if you want to train them to do it differently, they often won't. Um, and an indicator of this is if you've ever gone back and looked into your institution's theses and dissertations from recently and look back in the references and see how many times your students will refer to like deep proxied links into your electronic resources um, in their citations and their references. And it's sometimes a little bit scary. Um, and so the also, because of some of the infrastructure that exists around the, um, the ARC specifications, like the N2T resolver for global resolution, if you run across an ARC identifier for us and you plug it into that N2T, it actually then resolves just fine um, within our system, which is really cool. Um, so we've actually been one of the groups that has really tried to um, lean in hard on uh, making use of the different components of the ARC identifier specification. And so we have a bunch of our URLs, our, all of our URLs are really bu built on 
um, these arc identifiers and everything's kind of tacked on to the right of it. Um, and so some of the features, and this was uh, mentioned, the ERC records, um, there's a way you can get to those in an arc um, by adding a, a single question mark to the end of an identifier and it'll give you a, a response record back of what the thing is. Um, a double question mark will actually give you back the commitment to that identifier. Um, and then the, a lot of our other interfaces are built on those, like our manifest for our IIIF, um, image URLs that are really common to have access to, like a thumbnail or a small, um, if any of our metadata formats are available through those identifiers and just kind of easily hackable kind of URL patterns. Um, we also map our manifestations. And so within our models um, in our digital library, we have the ability to say, ah, oh, this digital object is a sequence of JPEG images. And it's also a PDF, which has a, all of those JPEGs in it. Um, and so we have different manifestations. And so those are represented um, within the ARC, the full um, variants on the ARC and those um, links into things like the IIIF sequence are also created there. And then we also have um, the ability you know, to embed content into other systems. And it's once again, all just built on that ARC. Um, when you get down into what we call file sets, which are the individual kind of major files or the, the important bit streams for a digital object, you're able to interact with a bunch of those different URLs. And once again, they all kind of maintain those arcs um, and you're then able to, uh, to deal with things. The only one we haven't been able to do that for is actually our IIIF image API, which has some different assumptions based on that, but everything else is really based on the arc identifier structure. And it's also built in a way that as you, like if you run into an, a URL, as you start to take things off, it resolves into meaningful content um, every time you kind of remove something from the path. So it's um, the idea, and we like this idea of, of hackable URLs where you can kind of do interesting things with them. So talking about minting identifiers, so <clears throat> we actually have a really simple, simplistic actually um, uh, way of doing this. We have a, a, a small um, uh, web.py service that is really just a, an identifier incrementer. It just has a file that just increments a counter. And then we have um, multiple gateways into that counter. So we have multiple counters going. Um, we have the ability to either give integers or a base 36 encoded version for reducing how, um, how many characters a identifier shakes up. Um, these are all run with ModWizG um, in an Apache server. So um, nothing too complicated there, but and it's not super robust. I think the implementation at UH is much, much more interesting than, than our approach to this. Um, we have different uh, kind of shoulders that we assign under meta PTH, meta DC, meta R, um, RKV for archive only stuff. Um, and then we also have a, um, a CODA um, shoulder that we use within uh, our preservation repository. And then we can also mint test, test arcs. And then we have actually some um, namespaces that we've uh, deprecated and uh, that have become obsolete. This is just kind of an overview of what those different namespaces historically have been used for and whether or not they're operational or obsolete. And this is part of our um, track conformance documentation that we did a few years ago that really talks about, goes more into depth about how we think about identification within our repository and how that's made available. Um, in addition to the URLs maintaining the ARC identifiers, we also print them out for the end user. So when you're actually looking at a digital object and you go down into the uh, the what section, there's an, a place for identifiers. And so you can have things like grant numbers and then also all of the identifier, all of the resources have their archival resource key um, kind of spelled out and made very clear to users. And if you click that, it goes back to itself and it does the, the, the things that you would expect for links to do on the web. Um, just as an example, <clears throat> so you can actually take the, um, so this is an interface into our, our CODA repository where we store our digital masters for resources. 
And so you can take the name from an ARC. The, this is the 1596980, and you can do a search for it in the system. <clears throat> and then it will give back, in this case, four different versions of this resource that had been uploaded over time. And so this is how we have um, still the ability to look things up by their public identifier, but then within the system, we're able to assign these CODA identifiers, which are all, once again, ARC identifiers. Um, and it allows us to have different versions of the same content, but still be able to retrieve it. Um, and so it's just our, our method for dealing with the, the versioning within our system. We just duplicate. And then the ARC identifier is made available. The external identifier is available um, to the end user of the ARC of the um, the CODA system, so you can have access to that. Um, and so, <clears throat> some of the things that we've learned along the way, the uh, there's some com there's some some components of the ARC specification historically that have been a little challenging for many um, web frameworks to deal with, just because they're 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 a little bit off in the weeds of like. It doesn't say you can't do this, so therefore we're going to do this, and that's not always implemented consistently within frameworks. So dealing with um, uh, the quest blank question marks and double question marks can be challenging. Um, dealing with uh, the extra colons can be a little challenging in some web web frameworks, um, and uh, we've had to jump through a few hoops on that. Um, we have probably a bit more. Um, uh, a bit more obvious um, uh, meaning in our identifiers than we would like. And if we kind of started over again, we'd probably have much more opaque identifiers than we currently do. But that's kind of water under the bridge at this point for our shoulder. And um, we probably would have a, a much, um, even from our only four or five different shoulders that we name under, we'd probably have fewer than those. Um, but uh, overall, it's been actually pretty, pretty solid and a good way of, for us, putting a lot of deliberate thought into how we think about adding new components to the digital collections and how we think about linking to those. And, um, and it's just made the persistence and um, the, the thought be kind of front and center as we're developing new interfaces and how they'll work within the arc structure. And um, I think one of the uh, the things that we've had folks point out is that like there's nothing that says you couldn't be this meticulous about just URLs, and there's absolutely nothing that says you couldn't. But I think having some of the um, the rules and structures within the ARC specification help you like reduce your options in a in a good way, and so you're not like thinking about things you could do. And therefore, kind of getting into spaces where, man, you know, maybe that's not the best way for long-term persistence of, of some of these things. Um, so we, we found that to be really useful. Um, we've got a little bit of um, some text on these if they're interested, if anyone's interested, um, uh, that uh, you can look at. Um, but with that, I think the presentation component of this is over. And we're happy to try to answer questions or, or field questions and all of that from the audience. Uh, thank you for all of your informative uh, presentations. So we really learned a lot. Um, here's some, um, now we're conducting the Q&A session. There are some questions already posted uh, in uh, chat. So we're going to start from here. Um, here is like one question from Susan Kong. Um, says like uh, uh, DOI has a lot of name uh, recognition in academia. Do you even get uh, faculty or researchers asking you to use DOIs instead of ARCs? If so, what is your response? Um, Bethany, um, answered this question. Uh, I don't believe uh, you've gotten that request from faculty so far. We do use DOIs in our institutional repository where we are interacting with the uh, faculty more. 
So um, uh, we don't have any other questions. Yeah, uh, let me, I've got a, I've got a little yeah. bit I can add to that. So, so we absolutely do mm -hmm. get those questions. Um, the DOI has definitely won the, uh, the publicity race in the identifier space. Um, it, it, um, they are backed by all the publishers and there's incentive there. There's, there's a lot of value for many faculty for the DOIs. Um, DOIs have to point to something. And you have to have persistence there, otherwise the DOIs break. And so for me, all of this is part of an overall strategy. There is not one just right. So if you have if you have a DOI, which you can mint, um, if it points to something that goes away, that DOI breaks just as well. And so for us, we there are situations where we will mint DOIs for resources that we have in the digital library because that's what the faculty want, which is great. It allows them to, to work in that space. Um, we have a project that we're getting ready to do with Oklahoma Historical Society, where we will be minting DOIs in addition to the ARC identifiers that we have. Now, another thing is there's some costs associated with those. And um, some of those costs are, they're, they're, they're very small, but as you start to think about minting hundreds of thousands and millions of identifiers, they become, non-trivial costs and there's not only just a cost association but there's also a assumed maintenance component to that um but i think yeah it's it's definitely one where we have a lot of faculty who come and they want you know they want a doi so therefore it'll be persistent and you have to say well it's actually <laughs> there's more to it than that we can give you a doi which is great but the persistence is actually because our repositories maintain the content well. And for us, that strategy has been based around the ARC identifiers, if that makes sense. Thank you. So there is another question from Ryan Solomon. Uh, what have you seen that would make you use more uh, OPCO ARCs in the future? So um, this question is for. So I can. I, so I'm the one yeah. that said I probably would uh, um, mm -hmm. become make them more art, uh, opaque in the future. Um, I know that when we look at our identifiers, we look at them sequentially because that has meaning to it. But they don't actually like. But they're assigned randomly within a small very Like it's weird. Like we have these assumptions within our own institution about how these identifiers are done because oftentimes they are sequential, but not always. <laughs> and so if you if you start to rely on them for certain things like that, then like weird assumptions for how the system works will get into your your brain, and so things will start to get really weird. And so for me, like removing that might be better. Um, so for us, like we know that the meta PTH things are for the portal and the meta DC things are, are in the digital library. Well, what happens if something needs to move between the systems, which is a function of our system? Suddenly things look, quote, wrong, even though they're not, it just happens to be what the identifier says. So for me, like removing that semantics from it is there's value there. Um, and even that, even if it's just internally, um, there is one other question, I think, from Jason long um yes i uh, well actually i had a, a question for sean um um i was wondering uh about uh he mentioned something about uh writing your own resolver and i was wondering if that's um uh, is that something you open sourced or is it available or it, it is available um so it is on our um github um repository um so it is okay. at github.com slash uh uh libraries dash digital um thank you mark for posting that so that is in chat so that actually goes to our resolver um and that is open source uh it does run off of uh, ruby on rails okay uh, so that's the language we built off of i'll take a look at it thank you uh any other questions uh, if we don't have uh, any other questions, we're going to uh, end the session. But before we end the session, uh, we're going to uh, make an announcement. 
please uh, join us for uh, our final TCDL session tomorrow morning. Um, then um, uh, this group would enjoy the digital collection metadata birth of Feather starting at 11. And please also take a moment to, to share your feedback to help us improve our next year's conference experience at uh, uh, evaluation form. Then um, now we're going to end the session. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at other TCDL sessions. Thank you.